Hey everybody, my name is Andrew and I'm joined by my friends and colleagues Marlon and Nick here at We The Collective. Thanks for joining me guys. Yeah, glad to be here Andrew. Yeah, thanks for having me man, I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Uh, so what we're going to be doing today is breaking down a camera shutter effect that we did on a recent front-end project. Uh, and I just thought that this was a really cool demo to share with everybody um, because it, it kind of teaches you two really useful techniques uh, or, or concepts rather. Uh, the first being some basic trigonometry, which is applicable in so many ways. And the second being how to think in polar coordinates, which sounds super fancy and sounds frightening to a lot of people. But it's uh, the goal by the end of this is that maybe it's not that bad and uh, it'll hopefully open up a lot of doors for you. Uh, so the assumption is that you have a knowledge of JavaScript. Uh, we'll, we're going to be drawing in a canvas, and that's that's kind of optional knowledge. I think I think you can get through this video uh, just understanding the concepts. You don't you don't need to know exactly what the canvas work is. Um, but yeah, uh, I think uh, I think you'll learn a lot here. So uh, this is our first video stream actually. So thanks in advance for watching, and we hope you enjoy. So the first thing we're going to do is just jump into the demo itself, uh, sort of what we're going to be recreating. So here's the demo as it existed on the project. And so you can see, I just have this video screen cap on a loop here. Uh, but as you can see, it's this sort of camera iris that expands after the page loads to reveal a photo and then the user can click to sort of snap that photo almost. Is the, is the images on, on the canvas as well? Or is it just that like little shutter effect that's going to be on the canvas? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, it's just the shutter effect. I mean, I suppose if you wanted to, you could do it however you like. Uh, but for mm -hmm. the sake of this sort of demo, we'll just have the image as like a you know, a CSS background on the body or something. Mm -hmm. um, no, but that, yeah. that looks cool, the way that it's sort of like very seamless integrated between the two. Cool, yeah, I, th I think so too. I really like this. Um, I'm pretty excited about this effect. Andrew, I had a quick one as well. I just, I noticed the reduced motion in the corner. Is that something that you're addressing in this as well? I'm not, but maybe I should. <laughs> I think that's beyond the scope of this, but uh, for sure, yeah, I think I think a, a proper reduced motion implementation of this would probably just I, I hate to even say it, but just not have the shutter animation at all. You know, uh huh. I think yeah. I yeah, think yeah. on the production that's site we that. we probably just skipped that. Okay, yeah. cool. Our, so yeah. let's hop over to some code. Um, actually, you know what, before we even hop over to code, I'm going to go to my trusty iPad whiteboard <laughs> because what I've done is I've taken a screenshot of the, uh, sort of like midpoint of this animation. Um, and it's going to be really useful for us to sort of break down what we have to draw, uh, to our canvas. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you should kind of notice two things, uh, right up front. Uh, the first is that the negative space, you know, that the camera shutter creates is a polygon, right? So mm -hmm. something like that, right? And in this case, we're looking at a hexagon. Um, and the second thing that you should notice is that, well, not should, the second thing that I am going to tell you is that uh, from each vertex or, or point of the polygon, there's sort of like a triangle stemming off of it, right? I see. And, and from this one, there's a triangle that kind of goes that way maybe, and there's one here, right? So really the, the goal here is to be able to think of this entire shape as a bunch of triangles uh, mm -hmm. that can be layered around a polygon. Um, okay. and, and that's what we're going to be doing. <laughs> mm, so. That's cool. I wouldn't have thought of it that way, I guess. Um, I, when I first saw it, I thought that they were like, you were initially just making 
the center and and then and then making the center the the shapes out of the center of it that that's that's pretty cool what do you mean like i thought that you had a shape mm -hmm. in the middle that w you would be scaling and then just calculating the other shapes based on that oh well that's actually exactly what we're gonna do uh oh really yeah yeah <laughs> so check this out so we have a polygon right mm-hmm let me redraw that here because I conveniently erased it. Um, so we know that we're going to be drawing those triangles at those points. Um, but what we have to do in order to calculate where those points are is we actually have to sort of encapsulate our entire polygon in a circle. Uh, and just bear with me here. I will explain that. But if you think about it as something like that okay this is a very a really good circle I, well, thanks. By, uh, <laughs> that, was by hand. That, was, that was really good man. <laughs> i was thinking it was somewhat crude but thanks guys i appreciate your support <laughs> um uh but yeah so if you'll notice that like because we're sort of bounding that polygon by its sort of smallest containing circle um you get some nice things like each point of the polygon sits along the perimeter of the circle. So if we can calculate what each of those points are, um, you know, really all we have to do to update that is change the diameter, or in our case, the radius of that circle to grow and shrink based on some input. And we'll, we'll basically have all of the shapes respond with that. Um, and I'll just oh. hop back, hop back to the demo here, so you can see that now that you have that sort of knowledge of what's going to be going on. Really, all we're doing is taking a circle, tweening it from a radius of zero to a radius of some gigantic value. I don't even know what, like browser width or something. Um, and yeah, and that sort of does the open effect. And then when the user clicks it, we just do a very quick animation down to zero and then back open again. I would uh, never thought of it like that. Yeah, um, that's really sweet. Out of curiosity, how did you, uh, what was your kind of thought process when you were first doing this? Like, how did you actually come up with that? Was it just trial and error or did you kind of plan that out as you were? So the first time I saw the design, I kind of freaked out and I was like, how am I going to do this? Like, can I use like a PNG and somehow just scale that up? And my kind of response to that was, well, probably, but you're loading a massive asset uh, and it's, it's probably going to be hard to keep it looking good and there's no customization. Um, so what I will say here, I have this book right here. <laughs> um, oh no. So a long time ago, I got this book by David Geary called Core HTML Canvas. Uh, and it's a really good book. Uh, it's very dry, <laughs> but, but one of the first things he shows you is like how to draw polygons. Um, and that actually sprung back into my head when I saw this and I was like, okay, wait a minute. The camera shutter shape is a polygon. So maybe like if I know how to draw that shape, maybe I can somehow like do the opposite of that and draw around that shape, you know? Um, and I mean, I'm not going to say that this was like a quick thing. I definitely spent a lot of time figuring it out. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the, this is the best, this, the programmatic, the canvas approach is the best approach to this sort of thing, just because we have so much customization over it. Like, you know, those gradients that you see on the triangles, we, we can customize that. Uh, we can, I mean, we could do anything. We could tie the radius of the, of the circle to like, you know, mouse position, or we could tween it like the demo here is doing, or we could yell into our microphone and make the iris bigger based on the input of our mic, you know, like there's so much you That's can do. Cool. cool. Um, uh, uh, on building on top of uh, Nick's uh, question. Um, so did, do you, 
when you're doing something like this, do you go and start drawing it and, you know, making some sort of idea of how you're doing it? Or do you just, do you tend to like just go into code and just giving a shot with what you know and then yeah. just building on top of that? Uh, I think in this case, I probably put pen to paper first, like literally put pen to paper uh, just to make sure that I like knew what I was going to at least try to do. Um, yeah. But I don't know. I'm, I have a bad habit of like just jumping into code pen and just like throwing stuff at the wall and seeing if it sticks, um, which I don't know. Maybe that's good that as like a, I mean, a lot of us do. Yeah. I don't think it's a bad habit per se. I don't know. Like I think typically in programming, like there's this like notion that you should like always have a plan and like, don't just start coding, but like for this type of thing, whatever, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, makes sense to me. Yeah. I mean, it's part of the fun too. Yeah, exactly. I guess the first thing we should do here, let's just let's just draw a circle uh, in the middle of a canvas here. So here is a blank code pen, and um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start with an HTML canvas element. So we'll write a canvas, cool, and maybe we'll give it an ID just for fun. We'll call it stage. Great. Really, that's all we need from the HTML side. I don't need any CSS yet. Uh, so in the JavaScript, the first thing we'll do is just get a reference to that. Uh, something like const, let's just call it, let's call it canvas. Sometimes I tend to like make really short, unreadable variables, and then I go back and read the code, and I'm just like, what was I, what is this? Like, what, I don't even know what I'm looking at. So, <laughs> yep. so lately I've opted for, too. yeah, yeah, lately I've opted for, ridiculously long explicative uh, variables. Get element by ID, stage. Uh, and then the next thing we're gonna do is get the canvas's drawing context. Uh, and it's just sort of uh, convention to label this CTX. It's just nice to have a smaller variable than saying context all the time, because we're gonna use this a lot. Uh, and I'll explain what that is in a sec. Uh, we're going to say canvas dot get rendering context. No, get, sorry, get context 2D. Okay. And that's where the CTX comes from, right? Yes, context. exactly. Uh, so the canvas itself is our element, like our actual HTML element. And the context is where all of the drawing operations happen. Um, so like, you know, making a circle, uh, rotating the canvas, transforming the canvas, whatever you can think of that happens on the context itself. Let's do a couple of things here first. Uh, let's just set the width and height of the canvas to our viewports width and height. Uh, so we'll say canvas.width is equal to window.inner width. We'll do the same for the height. Canvas height is equal to inner height. I think since I want to make this responsive, uh, I want to make it like fluid, right? I'm just going to make a function called like set layout or something. Uh, and we'll just put this, those two lines of code in there and attach it to a resize handler. So I'll just do that real quick. We'll say like uh, function set size. And put those in there. And maybe we'll also have a function just called init, which will just initialize everything. Uh, and in there, we can add the event listener. So maybe window, add event listener, resize. And we'll just give it an anonymous function. It's all good for the purposes of this. Uh, and we'll just say set size, right? And then maybe before we even add that, let's also just call set size. That way our sizing happens right from the get go. So there's a few things that I think are going to be helpful for us to keep track of. Uh, one of those things is like the center point of the entire canvas. Uh, and that's going to be useful just because we need to know like where our circle is where our polygon is, right? So I'll make, I'm just gonna make some global, well not global, but global to this component. 
variables. Uh, I'll say center x is equal to, uh, let's say, actually, I'm not even going to do anything. I'm just going to declare them here, center x and center y. And then in that same function, I'll just assign those to like, in this case, we'll just do dead center. So half of the width and half of the height, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll say center x is equal to canvas dot width uh, divided by two. Center y, canvas height divided by two. And because that's in our set size that runs on every resize, that should stay up to date for a while. Uh, the next thing I'm gonna do is just create a circle uh, in the middle of the document. And I think the best thing, just trying to look ahead is to just have like a function called draw. And we'll, mm -hmm. we'll call that once in this case, but once we start animating it, uh, you could call it, you know, on every frame or on every mouse move or whatever the case may be. Uh, so we'll say function draw. Great. And inside draw, I'll just make a comment here. Draw our main circle. Uh, okay. And so what we have to do, and this is where we start getting kind of canvassy, uh, but don't panic if you don't know canvas, because I will attempt to explain it. Uh, First thing we want to do is be in a path. So like every drawing operation in, uh, not every, every, uh, <laughs> every path based drawing operation in canvas needs a path. Uh, so we have to say context dot begin path. And that's mm -hmm. just a function that sort of kicks us off. Uh, and the next thing we're going to do is create a circle. Uh, there's no, unfortunately, there's no like circle method or anything in Canvas. So we're going to use an arc method, which takes a whole slew of parameters. Uh, and I'm just going to explain each one as I type it. So we'll say context dot arc. Uh, and the first parameter is the X position of the center of the arc, which or the center of the circle, which in our case is our center X variable that we declared. So we'll say center X. Second is the Y position, good enough. Uh, and the third parameter is the radius of the circle. Um, so I think for now, I'll just set it at 200 and see what happens. Uh, and now we start getting into some new territory. So the next two parameters are where on the path you want the arc to start and how far along a circle you want it to end. So if you think about it from a standpoint of degrees, you want this arc to start at zero degrees and go all the way around to 360 degrees. Does that make sense? For me, a circle, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Awesome. I did uh, I did have a question about that, the 200. Yeah. Is What what unit is that relative to? Is that pixels by pixels. default or? Yeah, yeah, it's pixels. Let's, since we're going to need this radius, because that's what we're going to be animating, right, is the radius of our circle. Um, I'm just going to store that in a variable as well. We'll just call it radius. Uh, I will initialize it to 200 right at the top there. So okay. there's our radius. Now, uh, back to the start and end points along the arc. Uh, we want to start at zero degrees, so we'll put zero for the for the next parameter. Uh, and now this end parameter, we want it to be three, 360 degrees, uh, but the sort of gotcha on, on, I think, most graphics programming applications is that they don't accept degrees as a value. Uh, they accept radians, which I will go over in just a sec what that means. Uh, but just for now, we want that to end at pi times two radians, which is equivalent to 360 degrees. So bear with me on that. I'm gonna jump over to the whiteboard thing in a second and we'll explain that. Uh, but after we draw in our arc, we just want to context close path and we will add a stroke. 
and I'm not seeing anything because I'm not ever calling draw. Let's call draw there. There we go. Oh, cool. Nice. And I'm going to call draw in the... And we've got a circle. <laughs> yes! <laughs> <laughs> it's cool, it. but uh, I guess that, that there... Yeah, it's strange to me that there is no circle, you know, uh, method on yeah. Canvas. But I, the arc is, is so flexible as well, right? Because if you want to just half half a circle or if you want to like a quarter circle or whatever yeah i mean check it out like do that. if i just manipulate that end angle like right now it's math pi times two if it's just math pi it's exactly like you said we get a half circle uh, right you know or if if i just put one we'll get one radian of an arc <laughs> um yeah andrew i just had a couple questions so firstly this stroke on a context is that just does that default to one pixel can we edit that at all or yeah does that work? yeah definitely uh it does default to one pixel but all you have to do is set the line width property on the com context uh to some pixel amount let's say 10 and that will apply it sweet okay so it's not a stroke itself right right cool so and this, I guess that's easy enough to edit. And the other one was um, where you're using arc. Are there like, is there a bunch of shapes on canvas or are they all relatively awkward like this? Can you just like <laughs> spawn a square or something like that? Or do you always have to use a... Yeah, yeah, you can. Um, so for example, there's a nice easy one. Uh, and when I say easy, I mean, it doesn't involve a whole bunch of like start path, end path, whatever, and that's just fill rect, which fills a rectangle. It takes four parameters, like a uh, start position and a y position. So maybe like zero comma zero, that'll be top left, uh, excuse me, uh, start x and a start y position, and then a width and height. So maybe like, I don't know, 100 wide and 200 tall. So that is a lot a whole lot easier than the whole making a path. This this makes a path for you and then strokes it. Um, but there are other methods that you can use that are more like imperative, like start path, and then you can create a rect path and you can fill that path, right? Um, but in terms of like triangles or in our case, polygons, no, you have to do that stuff uh, pretty manually. And we'll see as we get into it, like we'll we'll use paths to sort of like build out the points of our polygon and then you know stroke or fill or whatever accordingly cool so there's our circle uh now let's talk about this stuff in here right so uh as we were saying like the uh the method won't accept degrees as an input um so we had to put math.pi times two radians as our ending angle so I'm going to hop over to the iPad so I can attempt to illustrate what a radian is. Uh, okay, so here we are. Uh, let's, let's not worry about these just yet, but they will come in handy in a second, okay? Um, but basically what a radian is, is it's a distance along the perimeter of a circle. So that would be like one-ish radian, okay? And maybe that's like two radians along a circle, and interestingly enough, that is 3.1459 radians along a circle, which we know as the number pi, right? If that rings a bell, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Um, so... If, if 180 degrees is equivalent to pi radians, 360 degrees is equivalent to two times pi, right? Two pi radians. Um, so that's kind of what these are. Uh, these are just references for us. But basically we have zero radians and then we go up to pi divided by two, which is just, is just half of pi, right? This is equivalent to 90 degrees uh, and then we've got pi which is equivalent to 180 degrees uh, 
2 times pi, so 360 divided by 3, 2 pi over 3. Disclaimer, that's wrong. Uh, it shouldn't be 2 pi over 3, it should be 3 pi over 2, and that's just an on honest mistake I made when creating that graph. Uh, but here's a quick explanation as to why it's 3 pi over 2. Okay, so this is the culprit, just cross that off. Uh, what that should be is 3 pi divided by 2. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, if we know that a quarter of the way around our circle is pi over 2, well, three quarters of the way is going to be three times whatever that is. So we go one quarter, two quarters, and three quarters. That value should be three times pi over 2, which we can multiply to just be three pi over 2. Uh, and and then yeah back to 0 or 2 pi so 0 and 2 pi are kind of the same thing um, but of course in our in our canvas uh, we can't specify 0 and 0 as a start and end angle because then it won't move at all so our start mm -hmm. angle has to be one or the other uh, so we'll say like start at 0 and go all the way around to math pi times 2 or in the case of our graph 2 pi. Uh, Makes sense. I guess that there is, if you wanted to convert a random degree number, like 138, for example, to radians, then, then you would probably use a formula for that as well. Yeah, exactly. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, so you could say like, the formula for that might be like pi divided by 180 times whatever degrees you want. So here, I'll just pull up the calculator. Um, so if pi, oh, we have a pi number, that's cool. <laughs> so if we say <laughs> pi, if we know that, if we know that pi is uh, the same as 180 degrees, like around, around a point, uh, mm -hmm. we can get the equivalent of one degree by saying pi, this number, uh, divided by 180. So split pi into 180 pieces. And so that number right there is the equivalent to one degree. So if we know that that's one degree, we can say, okay, let's multiply that by, I think you said 138 degrees. Mm -hmm. So our value for 138 degrees around a circle is 2.4085. So like, just to like see if that actually works, let's just pass that number in as the end angle. So like two, four, oh, eight, five. Yeah. So now we have a circle that starts at two pi and goes around to 138 degrees. Uh, and then we close the path. So, so we get that line there. Let's see if I undo or if I comment out close path there we go. Maybe that's right. a little better to look at. Okay, so just to recap on all of this pi talk, uh, we, if, if we're thinking about going around the coordinate system in a circle, uh, we start at zero. Once we get to 90 degrees, we just kind of refer to that as pi over two because we know that pi is 180 great degrees. Uh, we won't use this number in this demo, but 2 pi over 3 is another useful sort of reference point. Uh, and then finally, back to 0, or a full 2 times pi. So what we want to do is get the, uh, the x and y coordinates of the various points of our polygon along this circle. Because if you go back to the, uh, to the screenshot here, remember that we've got our bounding, our encapsulating circle, uh, and each of these points lie somewhere along the circle itself. So it's going to be really, really, really hard to try and like eyeball that stuff and decide like, okay, if my first polygon point is here, sorry, that looks like a six. My first polygon point is here. I don't know. Maybe that's like, you know, 5.76 something in the X direction and like, five something in the y there's there's really no way to just like 
without thinking in, in terms of what we're going to talk about polar coordinates, there's no way to like accurate, accurately get that exact point along the perimeter of a circle. Um, so that's where polar coordinates in, come in. Uh, typically you think of a point that I'll just put up here off in the distance uh, as being referred to as maybe x comma y. And that's great if we know how many steps in the x direction and how many steps or units in the y direction we're going. Um, but when we're thinking about points along a circle, we need to think in radians and we need to think in angles, right? Like what is the angle that we're pointing in along this circle? Um, so let's imagine that we'll just draw a line from our, from our origin to, to that point. Uh, and let's just call that radius. So what polar coordinates are going to do is they're going to think of that point in terms of a radius and an angle. And I'm just using that crudely drawn theta symbol uh, to represent the angle. So this same point, considered in polar coordinates, is going to be labeled as radius theta. And in our case, theta is going to be some number in radians. Um, so for example, let me clear drawings here. Uh, if we had a point here at the very top there, our radius would be that and our angle would be pi over two radians. So then in our case, radius, well, at least for now mm -hmm. is 200, right? Yeah. So yeah, that exactly. would be always 200 by and then comma and, and, and the radian. Yeah, exactly. So you can kind of see where this is going uh, in that we know that our polygon is, let's say, a hexagon, right? A hexagon has six sides. And we also know that our hexagon can be wrapped in a circle. And a circle goes from zero to two pi. So in order to figure out where along this circle those points lie, we can take two pi radians and divide that by the number of polygon sides, which is six. So that'll actually give us whatever two pi radians split six even ways is. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, that does. I'm I mean, right now, when you say it, I can see that, you know, for example, the two foremost points at the very top, mm -hmm. they are, they're closer together than the, you know, or maybe not, maybe, maybe it's just because, you know, it's a hand draw circle, but <laughs> yeah. they look... It's, <laughs> it's my horrible drawing. You know, they're they actually closer. equidistant, yeah. <laughs> um, but Makes yeah. Sense. So like, okay, so let's just do some crude, crude math just to try and illustrate the point. Like if we know that pi is 3.14, uh, two pi is gonna be 6.28 radians. Uh, and I'm gonna divide that by six sides of my polygon. So that gives me 1.04 radians. Uh, so what that tells me is that each of my points on the polygon are going to be spaced out 1.04 radians from each other, which is really helpful to us because now all we have to do, I say all we have to do, what we have to do is just convert each of those polar coordinates. We know our radius. We now know our, our angle. Uh, we need to convert that into Cartesian, which is just our nice usual X, Y, so that we can plot that on the canvas. Um, those numbers are going to be like, crazy decimal places though that's why we can't just say like okay x and y is you know five comma seven uh we we first need to find the exact position in the polar plane and then convert it uh so that we can draw it let's set a variable for our polygon sides uh that way we can just easily update this thing and make it look however we want um so i'll literally just call that polygon sides is six uh, and so this circle that we've drawn, um, 
obviously we don't need it for the final product, right? Like nowhere in that effect did we actually see a circle, but I'm gonna leave it up here because it's very useful in terms of like thinking uh, in, in these coordinates. I'm gonna set up a quick uh, array to maintain each of our points. Uh, and then in the draw function, we'll sort of figure out where those live and we'll draw them. So I'll just initialize that. Uh, let's say I'll call it vertices uh, and I'll just make that an array of length polygon sides. And I will fill that for now with just null values. And we need to populate that. Uh, so the, what I'm thinking of is uh, that each item in this vertices array will be an object that has like an X and a Y property. Mm -hmm. So let's just make a function that, that sets that up. Um, here, let's call it uh, set vertices. Oh, whoa, look at that. And that also would probably only change on resize as well, right? Exactly. When you're recalculating your circle. Yeah, that's like, I mean, honestly, like if I, if I didn't need it to happen in resize, I would probably just throw it into the draw function. <laughs> uh -huh. But uh, but yeah. No, it makes sense. Yeah, we do, we do want this to happen on resize as well because everything about our canvas is gonna change. Like the center point changes. So now all of our vertices are somewhere else if we don't update those as well. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll make this function set vertices and what we'll do is just, uh, well, I guess first off, we're gonna calculate what our angle increments is. Uh, and to be honest, we could just do that at the top of the file since that's actually never gonna change. Uh, so let's just say angle increment and this is gonna be math pi times two so 360 degrees, right, divided by uh, polygon sides, which is six in our case. So okay. th this variable that we've got stored here should be whatever that, you know, one point something or other was that we saw a second ago on the calculator. Uh, cool. So then in set vertices, I will... Uh, Let's just initialize uh, a for loop. So I'm gonna say for let i start at zero. Uh, and this is gonna loop through all six vertices. So, um, you know, while i is less than polygon sides uh, and we'll increment i each time. Um, so now what we wanna do is convert between those polar coordinates and our, uh, and our Cartesian coordinates, the X and Y that we can use to draw to the canvas. So let's just set, let's set uh, an X and Y variable, const X and const Y. So we know our radius, which is I think, yeah, 200. Uh, and we know that our angle has to increment by that variable that we set each time, right? Mm -hmm. So, what we can do, and I'm just gonna spit out a magic formula here, but I'll explain it in a second. Uh, okay. In order to get the point along the circle, we need to say radius times uh, the, for the X value, the cosine of whatever angle we're trying to draw at, draw to. So in this case, it's gonna be angle increment. Um, but since that needs to be relative to the point that we're at, we need to multiply that by i. So if i is zero, our angle increment is gonna be i times zero, so zero radians. If i is one, <laughs> it's gonna be angle increment times one. When i is two, times two. When i is three, times three. So that's the way that we get around to our full circle. Um, okay, so that's cool. We've got that. And it's the exact same thing to convert from polar to Cartesian for the Y coordinate, except we're gonna be using the sine of that same value. So that's awesome. That gets us the right angles. Uh, the only thing that we have left to do is sort of tell it where to start from. So if you can imagine right now, it's starting from zero and sort of plotting our points along like this sort of a curve 
which is obviously wrong. We want it to start from our from our circle center point here. So all all I will do to to sort of let's call it translate that uh, is I'm going to add our center offset to these two x and y positions. So center x plus radius times math cosine of the increment and center y. Uh, I'm going to use minus here so that we go upwards on the canvas because on a canvas, you know, the more we go down, the greater the y value becomes. So if we think of it, if we want to sort of match it up to our graph and draw upwards, uh, we need to we need to be subtracting. So going in that negative direction on the canvas. Right, makes sense. Yeah, not not super important. You could just as easily do plus here. It would just we would be drawing in the opposite direction, which at the end of the day doesn't really have many implications for this particular use. Okay. Right. So <laughs> where does this stuff come from? Uh, I'm just going to take an arbitrary point. Let's put it right there along the circle. And we already know the radius, right? Mm-hmm which is 200 in our, in our example. Uh, and because of our angle increment, we already know that theta is whatever our angle was, right? It's whatever that multiple of I is. Mm -hmm. So what you can do to convert this, and it's not, it's not super important that you like memorize this concept, um, but I just wanna explain like where I get the whole radius times cosine, like where did that come from? How did I, how does that work? Um, so what we'll do, oh, oh, I guess what you'll notice is that you can actually make a right triangle from this diagram that we have. And uh, if you know the radius and the angle of this triangle here, or, or the hypotenuse and the angle, you can calculate the other two sides of the triangle. Uh, and I'll just, I'll keep it brief here. So, uh, so this is our Y and what this is going to be is the sine of theta and our X is the cosine of theta. Uh, and in order to get the exact position, we just multiply it by our radius. I think for the purposes of this video, you can kind of think of these as like magic formulas that you use to, to convert <laughs> between polar and Cartesian. But if you remember that uh, the sine of an angle is equal to uh, opposite over hypotenuse, right? So the sine of theta is y over radius uh, and the cosine of theta is whatever it is uh <laughs> so I forgot to, uh, it too, adjacent over hypotenuse right so really quickly i just want to elaborate on that a little bit and give you a kind of visual aid to help explain it a little better okay so here's that right triangle that we were looking at and we know our angle and we know our radius so what we're looking for are our x and our y uh, and in order to get those values, we need to think back to those ratios that you might have heard of. So ka toa, uh, like this, S-O-H-C-A-H-T-O-A. -A -A. Uh, and what those stand for are sine is equal to the opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine of the angle is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. And tangent, well, we're not going to be using that. But these two are going to help us out quite a bit. So if we want to solve for x, that's the adjacent side to our angle theta, right? So which one of these two formulas or ratios, so or ka, uh, is going gonna, is gonna to give us that adjacent side? Well, we see that adjacent is there. So using some algebra, we can rearrange uh, the equation to get us that adjacent value. So you're looking at something like, you know, the cosine of theta is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse, so x over 
radius in our case the radius is the hypotenuse uh, yeah and just using some algebra you can multiply either side by radius to sort of cancel them out right so what you end up with is x equals cosine of theta times the radius and then you do the exact same thing for the y so y sine times radius hop back to the code here so we've declared each of those and then we we'll just want to push that x and y data to our vertices array uh, so we'll access that uh, by saying vertices i uh, is equal to an object of x and y and that's just es6 you know this is the same as saying x is equal to x y is equal to y right i'll just shorten that uh, great. So now we have vertices. So now we can draw them. You know what? Let me put set vertices in our resize as well. So we'll set the canvas size, we'll set the vertex data, and then we'll draw. Okay. So in our drawing. Uh, so yeah you you go along you have your points you have you know how to convert them so do you when you're drawing a path do you i guess you're going to go through this so so sorry for asking it in advance but not at all um do you draw lines or do you have like do, do you make the whole path completely so does that i mean it, does that even matter or are or are you just trying to get the points where you want them? Yeah, like for the actual like production version of this, yeah, like all we need is the path data, or sorry, the, the points data, the vertex data, <laughs> like the position of those. For the purposes of this though, this demo or this video, I'm gonna draw all of this stuff out. So yeah, I'm gonna keep our circle there like we have it. Once we iterate through the points in a second, I'm gonna draw a path between each one of them so that we can actually visualize this stuff. Um, uh -huh. the triangles will come later, like the, the ones to sort of piece together the shutter. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I just think that stuff is useful. Um, and honestly, yeah, that's like, a good debugging. it's yeah. also a good debugging tool, you know, like you, it, you kind of know what you're doing when you're drawing the triangles after it. Actually, that's a really good point. I'm going to make a variable called debug true. And I'll only draw those guides if debug is on. Okay. And maybe, you know, after this video is done, like I'll set up the code pen so everybody can see with maybe like a toggle switch so you can toggle that on and off. Okay. Uh, so let's say, let's just wrap this in if debug, we're going to draw our main circle. Cool. And then let's say, uh, I guess draw, draw the polygon. polygon? Yeah draw our polygon so a couple things i'll do here is i'll draw a tiny circle at each point and then i'll connect them mm -hmm. but just okay just for the record and to the viewers this is completely unnecessary it just helps to sort of visualize it so you can skip this if mm -hmm. you want. <laughs> um let's see so we've got our array which now has x and y data for each uh so we'll We'll basically just loop through all of that. Uh, and this time I'll just use a for each. I'll say uh, for each vertex. I do want the index of each one. Uh, I'm going to, let's draw the dots first. Uh, so I'll say dots. And we'll say, so this is for each vertex, we're going to con context.begin path. Uh, we're going to do another arc, just like we did a second ago. A second, just like we did a long time ago <laughs> now, it feels like. Uh, and so previously when we were doing this arc up here, we started the midpoint of that circle was at the center of our canvas, right? Uh, but this time we want 
each of the center of our tiny little dots to be at their respective polygon points. So um, we have our vertex, so I'll say uh, vertex dot x is the x coordinate, vertex dot y is the y coordinate, radius, I don't know, 10, just to see what happens. Uh, and then same thing, we just want full circles, so we'll start at zero angles, zero radians, and, <laughs> and move to math <laughs> pi times two radians. And we will type it correctly. Okay, let's close that. And let's fill it this time. So there we go. Oh, oh man, that's awesome. Oh, they're beautiful. They are beautiful, aren't they? <laughs> yes, and I'm sorry, but much more perfect than your draw, man. Sorry. Oh, that's brutal, man. I mean, it was a good circle what you did. It was really good. Okay. But well, this is this is you know this is code. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful uh, thing. Uh, there's nothing I can do with that <laughs> except just. Thing you did, Andrew. I'm just gonna go home today and just think about how I can be better. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, cool. So those are our dots. Let's be more specific with these comments. Draw our polygon dots, and then we're going to need another loop to draw the lines that connect them all. So let's call that draw our polygon lines. And let's just say right before that, we're going to start a new path. Begin path. And once we're inside, we'll just do a check. Um, we're going to check if we're at the very first vertex, we're going to move to that point. And if we're at any of those subsequent vertex vertices, we'll line to those points. Uh, so we'll just, we'll use I for that. Uh, if I is zero, um, then we will context.move to vertex X, vertex Y. Uh, otherwise, we will line to that same point. Uh, great, and so once once that sort of path is, is established, we can close off the polygon that we've been drawing. Close path, and we can stroke it. There we go. Awesome. Okay, cool. So, oh, very cool. Yeah. And just since this is debug stuff, I'm going to set the opacity of these strokes and fills and stuff to uh just not be solid black. Uh just to sort of illustrate mm -hmm. that they're not like necessary. Um so I'll just set some properties on the context itself. We're going to say stroke style is equal to we'll just do a string of like I don't know, 0.3 black. Uh, and then same for fill style. Cool. Yeah, that, that should work. Hopefully that's easy enough to see. Okay, so now we're getting to the actual camera shutter. Uh, and just going back to our mental model or mental diagram we need to draw triangles that stem from each part of these from each point of the polygon right uh, so what you can do in canvas is create off-screen canvases uh, to like draw data to something that sort of just doesn't exist in the dom uh, and then you can place it wherever you need in this case on our main canvas if you're not familiar with that sort of concept it's it's very similar to how like you might do like a document dot create element right and and it's sort of in the oh, okay. the browser's memory but it hasn't actually been appended to the body yet if you know what i mean yeah okay. makes sense yeah sweet so we're going to do the same thing we're going to create a, a canvas that doesn't really exist anywhere i will append it to the body just so we can like see what we're doing to it like how we're actually drawing this off-screen triangle that we're then going to place all around the polygon. But we, we don't actually need this to be appended to the body in the end. 
so what I'll do, I'll just start, uh, just like we have these this canvas variable up here in this context, I'll just make another one, kind of stick it in there. I'll call it triangle canvas, and we will document dot create element. So will this be multiple, this would just be one large canvas or will it be multiple? Cause there's tons of triangles, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So it's gonna be one, it's gonna be one triangle canvas. And if I just hop back to the original uh, diagram, you can see they're all actually exactly the same. Um, oh, I so, see, okay. Like if I wanted them to be different, we could we could totally like do some kind of, you know, drawing routine where like for each of these vertex vertices uh, we create a different triangle but since they're all the same in this case i'm just going to use this one and kind of like paste it where i need it to be you know cool yeah cool so we've got our triangle canvas that's just a canvas that exists somewhere and we want to just like with the main canvas we want to get a reference to that canvas's context so i will keep with the naming convention and triangle ctx triangle canvas dot get context 2d right off the bat uh what we'll need for these triangles is we need the dimensions to be big enough to like bleed off of the screen so that you don't see where the triangles end right um and you could probably do some crazy math to figure out what that is uh, but I found that it's easiest to just uh, pick whatever side of the viewport is longest and set the triangle canvases dimensions to be that and that that does the job just fine um, so that's what we'll do and in order to do that I'm gonna need uh, just to maintain a variable that will update and resize um, I'm gonna call it longest side and in where was that function set size? So Andrew, because think... these are all the same length. Yeah. You only need one triangle or you're, and then you're going to rotate them and position them. Yeah. Is that what you're going to do? Exactly. I see. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll just say longest side. We'll say, what is the maximum, uh, you know, between I guess canvas dot width, or or you could say window dot width, whichever doesn't really matter. Canvas dot height, that's cool. And since that's in set size, uh, that will also happen on resize. So we should always have a number of which is greater, the height or the width of the viewport. Let's create our triangle. Uh, make a function. We'll say create triangle. Uh, so we'll say triangle context uh, dot let's begin path although I don't I don't think this is necessary to begin a path here but we will just for completeness uh, we'll begin a path and then maybe we'll just draw so my idea is that here it's probably best if I draw it out so pretend that this is our triangle canvas what I want to do is say like okay We'll start at our zero, zero point, and I just want to draw a line that basically goes all the way to the end and then comes to some point down here and then connects. So we're going to be drawing something like that, uh, you know, and this may look different. It may look something more like that, but this angle is what's important. Could you just use that diagram and put that in the diagram? Um, just, just so I can, you know, just so we can visualize on the diagram and that, oh, you know, yeah, that yeah. The screenshot of the, the demo. So if you take a point in there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this guy. Yes. Yeah. So if we're, uh, at our first polygon here or our first <laughs> vertex, obviously the, the intended thing to do is, is draw this shape. Um, mm -hmm. But just to make it easy on us, we're just gonna draw going to the right here first, uh, and then mm -hmm. and then we'll use this drawing and rotate it as we need. So if I go back to that, what we're gonna look like before any rotation happens, we're gonna look something like 
this. And once we have that triangle, we can then rotate it uh, and we'll, we'll kind of like, you know, incrementally figure out like what, what rotation that needs to have in order to look right. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I also forgot, does this, on the actual animation, does it rotate when the shutter comes down as well? It actually doesn't. Um, and I was thinking about adding that at some point. I mean, obviously not for the project because that's done, but I think it might look cool if it did, if the whole canvas did rotate as it opened. But yeah, that's certainly something we can look into later. <laughs> um, yeah, it'd be cool. Yeah. But I guess does the camera do that? I don't know. Man, the camera's weird. I <laughs> I spent a lot of time just like <laughs> looking at videos of camera irises and like how they behave and technically like are, are at least on some shutters that i've seen they're not perfect triangles they're actually like curved kind of blades like if you could imagine that like one side of the triangle is like concave i guess is the word um and i think okay. that sort of like adds to the look of it actually rotating but i mean for the sake of Making a cool thing on the web. I, I don't know how realistic <laughs> we need to get. Um, one thing I will do is, like, we'll make a gradient fill for each of these that looks a bit more realistic. Let's hop back to the code here for a sec. We're going to line two. Actually, maybe I should move two first. I'm not sure. Just to be safe. I mean, it can't hurt anything, right? I bet you move to starts a path, so we don't even need that. We're just gonna move to like the top left coordinate of our triangle, just like we saw in the diagram a second ago, and we're gonna line to uh, the the width of it, right? So uh, the x value of the line that we're gonna draw is gonna be at triangle canvas dot width and zero in the y direction, and then for the actual angle of the triangle. Uh, we're going to need to figure out what the polygon or what the hexagon's exterior angle is. I have a tab conveniently open called exterior angle of a regular polygon. Uh, and this is just a nice, easy formula um, <laughs> in order to get this value. And really all it is is 360 uh, divided by the number of sides. So I kind of mentioned it earlier, but since we're working with a regular polygon, all of its exterior angles add up to 360. So we can get an individual one by the same way we figured out with the angle increment, by taking that, that two pi and just dividing by a uh, number of sides. I mean, we already have that variable here in angle increment. So just for clarity's sake, I'm going to make another variable, which is going to be the same thing. I'll just set it equal to angle, angle increment, but it's going to be called exterior angle. Okay. And what we need in order to calculate that, right, the angle of our triangle is actually conveniently the exterior angle of our polygon, which means that. So if I were to kind of do this, each of those angles would add up to 360 degrees. Um, so we're going to use that angle increment, or we renamed the variable to exterior angle to figure out what the triangle is that we need to draw on that external canvas. And then we'll go back to create triangle and we'll say triangle dot, oops, triangle CTX dot line two. I'm just gonna break this onto multiple lines since it'll get long. Uh, same way, same way we used uh, that polar to Cartesian conversion to figure out the X, Y coordinates of each part of the polygon. We're gonna do that to figure out what, what our, our third our one, two, three, our third point of our triangle is going to be. Uh, now, since we're starting at the top left, we don't need to add a radius or anything like we did for the polygon. We're just going to say uh, triangle, start at triangle canvas dot width, and we'll multiply that by the cosine of 
exterior angle. So this is exactly the same as what we did uh, when we calculated the vertex points, right? Same idea. You're just taking the, the sort of length, the length of your radius times cosine of the angle for x, sine of the angle for y. So you can think of that as our radius. I don't know if that's helpful at all, but so that's for the x and then for the y we'll just say the height. It doesn't really matter because they're both the same in this case. We, we set them to be whatever the longest side of the viewport is, uh, is the sine of the exterior angle. Okay, and then last thing we'll do is we'll say triangle context dot fill and that will fill whatever the current path is. You know what, let's close the path. Okay, uh, so obviously this doesn't look like anything yet because again, this, this canvas just exists in the ether so we need to uh, append it to something. So let's maybe, just for now, we'll do this in init, triangle canvas. We're gonna document dot body dot pen child triangle canvas. Oh, you know what? We forgot to call create triangle. So let's do create triangle and then we'll append it. And hopefully, hey, we see something. Okay. I feel like that should be going all the way to the edge. Why is that not happening? Do you ever set the width of the triangle canvas? I thought I did, did I not? Where is it? Oh man, I'm not, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so that's that's the whole reason we were right. maintaining the longest side was that uh, we, we want our triangles to just be set to like some massive value, in this case, the longest side of the viewport. So uh, let's do that. Let's say triangle canvas dot width is equal to longest side and variable naming is not consistent but that's fine okay so there we go we've set that and because it's in set size that'll update so we're good there let's okay there we go that's kind of more what i was expecting to see so the triangle is going off screen because it's drawing from the from the zero coordinate as far to the right as the longest size of the viewport so in this case it's taking it's taking a browser heights worth and just and just drawing that that distance not not super important as long as we have a really big distance we're fine why don't we just create triangle let's put that in the set size function i guess there's no there's no reason not to right create triangle when when are when do you plan on adding it to the final canvas I guess um, that's where it yeah, probably as, should be. As soon as we do this, yeah. I'll probably do that first thing in draw so that that gets stamped down first and then our, our optional debug guides go on top of that. So let's just say create triangle is... Uh, I'm going to clear it out first just so that every frame it has something new. Uh, clear rect. Triangle canvas dot width triangle. And clear rect just clears an area of the canvas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks for bringing that up. Um, right. It's it's kind of the same as that fill rect thing we were talking about earlier. Uh, it just takes an x and y and then a width and height of space to clear out any drawings. Okay. So the idea is mm -hmm. that. Uh, every time this happens so potentially on resize or potentially on every frame if you were tweening it um we would have a, a clean slate so you wouldn't have a bunch of triangles drawing on top of each other at different positions mm -hmm. uh, so we'll clear that we move and also just so we have something a little nicer to look at let's set the fill color to like just anything this is not nice but red, <laughs> red is fine <laughs> Maybe we'll call that update triangle because we're going to be updating it in set size. Okay, that feels pretty good. Uh, so now 
in our draw. Let's do this. Just we'll do this before everything. Uh, the way the way canvas layering works is like the first thing that it draws gets drawn on top of by any subsequent paths or shapes or whatever. Uh, so if we have debug on, we want all our guides to to draw on top of of what we're about to do. Um, so I'll just do another loop. I really I just need uh, these vertices. What we'll do. I should probably have a function for this. Maybe something like place triangle and that maybe takes in uh, like a vertex and an index. That way we have the data and uh, the index so we know how much to rotate it. Let's let's do something like that. Now obviously that function doesn't exist but... Um, so your rotation is going to be based on the index of the point and not... Exactly. So the and position, not the angle of the point in relation to the polygon? It is. It's both of those things, yeah. Okay. Uh, we can't know what that angle is unless we know which index, which point we're dealing with. I see. Because we need to multiply that incrementer value by i uh, in order to get the full amount that we need to rotate it. Right. Uh, I see what you mean. So uh, vertices for each vertex, we're going to make this function called place triangle, and that's just going to be like a stamp that stamps this thing down wherever we need it. Uh, so let's let's write that. That's function place triangle. Uh, it's going to take a vertex and an index. I guess we can just call that i, whatever. Uh, so inside place triangle, what's going on there? Doesn't like that. That's okay. Uh, we will use a canvas function called draw image, which will, uh, which can take another canvas as a parameter, and we'll just slap it onto each point of our polygon. Here's a couple of new things we're going to talk about. I'm just going to kind of do it, and then I'll explain it once it's done. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we're going to save the context. Oh, I'll explain it as I go. We're going to save the context first, which means we're allowed to do any rotations or translates or other transformations on our on our canvas uh, without screwing it up. So like save kind of saves the context state where it was. And then after you do all your things that you need to do, like your rotations, you can ctx.restore, which places that existing context back. So the reason we're gonna do this is because it's a lot easier to figure out like where you need to draw, in this case, a triangle, if we just translate our entire main canvas over to the vertex we want and draw it at zero, zero, and then translate it back. Uh, it's not a necessary step, but it's just, it's just an easier way to draw things. And that becomes especially good for rotation because if this is our canvas, we're gonna translate to a vertex we're going to rotate and then we're going to restore the context. So that whole thing ro rotated based on the vertex point that we've translated to because now this is our zero, zero point. Uh, and I understand that that's confusing, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that'll that's make correct. sense. So you save the context state, meaning all of its rotations, all of its transformations are now saved. And then you're gonna do all of that. So you're gonna move the context to a position and you're gonna transform it, uh, sorry, rotate into a position, like into a degree as well. Sort of like um, you do with CSS, I guess. Yeah. And then, but then when you do a restore on your context, all of what you've done and what have you applied is actually saved. All that is returned is its rotation and its translation. Yeah, exactly. Right? So, like, so we imagining we essentially... if I imagine it with CSS, I would just translate and rotate, and then maybe I do I don't know a color change or something, and then I revert back that rotation and transformation, but keep the color changes. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So for place triangle, we're just going to do the first one here. I'm just going to say if i is not zero, uh, return. So that way we'll only get the first one. Uh, so we're saving the context. We're translating our main canvas, right? We're taking, we're translating it to 
our particular vertex. So our zero, zero point of our main canvas is now at our vertex. So from there, we can apply a rotation. I'm just gonna leave it at zero radians for now. Uh, and then we're gonna draw image. And this takes, this function actually changes based on the amount of parameters it receives, but uh, I'm just gonna use the simplest version of it, which is the first parameter is some kind of image or canvas context. Uh, so in this case, we want triangle canvas. And the second and third parameters are just like the destination coordinates where you want to put it. Uh, and that's just zero, zero. And there we are, place triangle. Whoa, look at that. Okay, so maybe our radius is a bit big to see this here. Let me shrink that just so we can. Sweet. Yeah. Let's do like a hundred for our radius. Okay, there we go. So we made it. <laughs> We've drawn <laughs> a triangle sticking out of a dot somewhere. <laughs> That's awesome. We should congratulate ourselves. Um, so now this, uh, like you can see that I only, I rotated it by zero radians uh, or zero degrees. So the next sort of step here is to figure out what the rotation is so that this side of the triangle matches sort of juts off in that direction along the polygon side right so i'm just going to do this piece by piece like i said so i think the first thing i want to do is i'm just going to rotate it to face up like perfectly up this this plane of the triangle is just going to go straight up and we know from our graph that that sort of 90 degree increment is pi over two, right? If you remember that. Mm -hmm. So let's just rotate it uh, by math.pi divided by two and see what that gives us. Okay, so not the direction I wanted. Let's just put a negative on there. There we go. So we rotated it negative pi over two, negative 90 degrees. So and that's because what you mentioned, right? Like canvas goes top right, like top left, positive number yeah, down. But exactly. what you want it is that way, so you, you just negative it. Exactly. So you know, in a coordinate system, like you're saying, the number is increasing, but when you translate that to x and y coordinates in a canvas, increasing means going down. Right. Uh, okay, so if we go back to our iPad diagram, right now our triangle looks something like this, right? Like our left, our left point of our triangle is kind of like that. So we just mm -hmm. need to get it over that little extra bit, which is kind of convenient because it's just this exterior angle divided in half. So we can say we've got our math pi over 2. Sorry, let me get the code back. Uh, and go. we'll just subtract a little more from that, and we'll say exterior angle divided by 2. Well, there we go. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So we figured it we got out a blade. for one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, like you said, it's convenient that, well, not convenient, but, you know, it's derived from being in a circle that, pretty much everything is just like half of it. You know, it's half of something, basically. Yeah, yeah totally. And what's cool about this, I'll, I'll just jump ahead, is like, what if I change polygon sides to 12? That, that just works. It just works, yeah. That's you know? pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Or, or eight in this case might be easier to see. Yeah. That's maths right there. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Maths. <laughs> <laughs> so here so that's cool but the problem is if i take out my only draw one code we get upwards pointing triangles for every single vertex now they're drawing on top of each other so you can't really see it that well except for these last couple um so we need to somehow change the angle based on the index of the point and that's why i brought that uh, I parameter in here. So this is kind of silly, but 
I'm just gonna say if i is greater than two, return. So we're only gonna draw a couple of these. Oops, greater than, just so we're not like overwhelmed by triangles, right? Mm -hmm. um, could you, so I guess that you could use uh, regular CSS values for like stroke style, food style and things like that? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, Canvas is awesome. You can you can give it like any CSS string. So you could say blue, or you could say you know hex zero 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 ff, right? Or this, or mm -hmm. HSL, or whatever the other ones are these days. Could you apply like an opacity to these triangles, just so yeah. like yeah. you can see the parts where they overlap. Kind yeah, of? that is a very good call. So instead of fill style red, let's just say, well, let's pop in HSL since I said we can do that. Uh, we'll say that the hue is zero, the saturation is 100%, and the lightness is 50, and let's say it's 0.3 on the alpha. There we go. There you go. Cool. Good call. Um, okay, so really, just thinking back to our mental model, the only thing that's changing is that amount of exterior angle rotation. So in theory, if we just take that exterior angle value and multiply by i, and just kind of like tack that on to each rotation, we should be good. So let me try that. So here's our thing. I'm just gonna make this a little bit wider. And I'm going to also subtract exterior angle times I. Okay, so we're getting somewhere. It's hard to see, but it's a good sign that we don't see any weird overlap or gaps, right? Yeah. Okay, so I'll take out the if statement. And then we'll make this actually do something cool. We'll put a gradient on it so we can see the, the difference. Sweet. So there we have it. A bunch of triangles drawn <laughs> around this polygon. Uh, now, if I take off our debug, that looks about right. Very cool. Yeah, it's not bad. That's really cool. Cool to see it all come together like that. Yeah, right? Finally. <laughs> we made it. <laughs> Uh, okay, cool. So I have some gradient code here. Here's our fill style. Uh, I guess we'll keep that there for now. But what we want to do in order to create a gradient uh, is we're going to say, here, let's just make it constant. We'll call it gradient. And we'll say uh, triangle context dot create linear gradient. The parameters on this are like a start position and an end position for the for the gradient sort of like control line if you've ever used like sketch or illustrator you know how like when you put a gradient fill on something it shows a line that, that sort of dictates uh -huh. like the direction of that that's what this is so we'll do something like okay we want it to start at zero zero and honestly like this is just arbitrary stuff that i thought looked good We'll do gradient zero zero, and we'll say that the endpoint of that line is triangle canvas dot width and zero. So, kind of just random values that I thought looked good. Uh, and what we'll do is now that we have that defined, we'll add some color stops. So we want to say gradient add color stop, and this takes. Oh, that's cool. So first you create the line, that line you just mentioned. And then you add the stops to it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's cool. Which is great because it gives you some really nice control over it. Um, yeah. So for the first stop, uh, we'll just put we'll we'll start it at zero. It takes a, a number from zero to one in terms of like the percentage along that line that you've defined. So we'll say zero, and then uh, you know whatever, just a string of that shade of gray. Uh, and then I'll just copy that line. I'll add one more color stop that just goes to a solid black. And I will put that 30% along, so 0 0.3. And again, I just, I pre-figured out these numbers, so it, these are what looked good. Uh, mm -hmm. And we will, down here, where we set our fill style, I'll just put it up here to be with the gradient stuff. We'll just set our fill style 
It's a gradient. That should give us what we want. Cool. Yeah. Oh man, that looks sweet. Looks so much better, right? That looks That's really awesome, cool. huh? Yeah, yeah, dude. So let's... That looks just like James Bond, huh? Dude, <laughs> it totally does. Let's crank <laughs> that up to like unique. 10. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. that's James Bond if I've ever seen it, <laughs> right? Uh, Love that. See? Okay, so huzzah, we made it. Now, the only other thing I'm going to do, and I promise this will be quick, is I'm going to tie the radius to some kind of input just so we can actually see some sort of camera motion. I think I'm going to just do mouse position just because that's nice and easy <laughs> without pulling in like a tweening library or anything like that. So let's just throw that in here. In the initialization, we will add an event listener for point of move. Let's give it the event. So point of move, the event point of move gets, a, I believe <laughs> it gets an X property. Like oftentimes I'll just use client X, but we'll take a risk here and we'll try the X property. I don't know, this might be naive, but I'll just say, let's let radius equal, uh, you know, E dot X. Oh, and then we want to draw again. Well, our circle is obviously working because we can see that radius changing. Uh, so what are we missing? So when your mouse move, your vertices also need to change, right? Because Oh, you're changing yeah. your radius. Good call. Good call. Okay, so let's uh, let's set vertices as well. We'll say when you move the pointer, we set our radius, we set our vertices, and then we draw. Hey, yeah, good call on that. Nice. So now there's our mouse control movement. That is so cool. And it kind of like that you can see. So cool, man. When it gets down to there, you can kind of see like it almost has that rotation to it. It does. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. Think it's, I, mean, I think it's an optical illusion. Even but... after it, it does have a little bit of a rotation to it. Yeah. Here, let me take off those debug. Yeah, there we go. That's great, man. Yeah, not bad, right? And then here, just to make it fully complete, Let's like let's find a let's find an unsplash image or something from Codehead. That'll do. Okay, background image and let's say background size, cover, and background position. Let's just say fifty fifty. And there we go. Oh, dude, that is so cool. Yeah. So you can see that it looks like there's a little bit of gap happening between the triangles where we're kind of seeing the image behind it, but that's, that's fine. I mean, you could, you could like add a stroke to these if you wanted to make sure it's probably some sort of rounding yeah. like half a pixel or something. There's so many fractions in that, right? Yeah. Here, let's do that just to see what happens. Uh, I have a feeling that if we add a stroke to this, we're gonna on like maybe the last instance of the triangle we might see a little bit of weird overlap but that's okay because unfortunately on canvas you can't draw inner borders you can only draw mm -hmm. strokes like right on the sort of straddling the the border of the path um but that's okay let's say uh triangle context dot stroke style um ccc i don't know and then we will yeah more or less right that's yeah we could probably do with a, a darker shade on the stroke but yeah there you have it so that uh that was a bit of a lengthy one wasn't it but uh, i think i think the effect <laughs> was cool and hopefully i'll edit this down for you guys and for the masses and uh yeah maybe we'll come out with something that works for everybody and teaches someone a thing or two that was really cool. I mean, that was canvas, that was polar coordinates, that was like Cartesian coordinates, a little conversion between radians and degrees. That was really cool. Yeah, thanks. I think I think the uh you know, getting those 
that that polar to cartesian conversion i'm just gonna guess is the most confusing part of this when you're saying like radius times sine of theta or whatever but that's all you need like if you if you even if you just memorize that that in order to convert from one to the other it's radius time or, or length times you know cosine or sine of angle like it just unlocks so many doors and that's and, really cool yeah yeah i guess there's yeah, there's a bazillion things that you can do based off of triangles. Like you just did like adding, just changing the number of points and getting that different kinds of, you know, polygons. And that on itself is just like really flexible. And yeah, that, that was really cool, man. Cool. Well, thanks, guys. I thought. Yeah. I mean, I should probably add to that. Yeah, coming from someone with minimal canvas experience and and definitely no further knowledge of maths since secondary school. That was uh, really, really helpful. And really, um, I think you explained everything really well. That was really good, man. I really enjoyed that. That was great. That's that's great. Yeah, hopefully it wasn't too sort of wishy-washy and confusing. But yeah, I mean, I think I think if you learned anything, that's a, that's a takeaway, right? Like, I remember when I first that same book that was like teaching how to draw polygons. Like when I first read that stuff, I was just like, what are you saying to me right now? Like, <laughs> are you kidding me? Like, I feel like I'm back in some advanced math class. And, and honestly, it's just enough of that repetition. Just, it just becomes something you can use, you know? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Awesome, man. Yeah. Cool. All right, guys. Well, thanks. Have a good night.